Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invites you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing Grace. I hope you're having a wonderful morning. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, your day is starting with a great cup of coffee. I'm starting a smoothie today, which is weird, but uh, I will have a coffee shortly. Well, today I've got some encouraging stuff. Uh, we had uh, uh, a, a conversation with Richard Murray. It was well over a year ago. This, I think this is the first one I ever did with him. Um, but we were talking about finding hope in the middle of fear and frustrations and cultural stuff going on. This is in the middle of COVID. Um, but we we're also talking about deconstruction and renovation of our soul. Sorry, not soul, our faith. And how to understand that. So this conversation was quite timely. I thought, let's reshare it because this in the summer, we're just resharing uh, past the, the best stuff we've had in the past year. Um, looking forward to brand new recordings for uh, September and on. So let's get into this. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Um, and let's get into this conversation. I think you'll love it. Here we go. See you. Everything's on. So hello and welcome to Still Growing in Grace. Uh, I'm Mike Zenker and uh, I have special guest uh, Richard Murray here with me. So Richard, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. We, we were supposed to uh, be involved in a conference together in Windsor, Ontario at the end of September and then this COVID thing hit and it was all canceled. So uh, this is the first time I am meeting Richard. So you get to see the interaction of what we're going to do and chat about. So uh, Richard, hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm blessed, Mike. How are you? I'm really good. Wh where are you located and what do you do? Okay, I'm located in Dalton, Georgia, which is northwest Georgia. We're about 20 minutes south of Chattanooga, Tennessee, but we're over the Georgia line. Uh, so we're really, you know, we, we hang out in Chattanooga all the time, but we're technically in Georgia. And I'm a criminal defense attorney. I uh, have been since 19, basically since 1986. And uh, we've lived here and raised our seven children here. So uh, that's, but obviously that's what I do and what I've yep. done. But, you know, that's the, obviously with, with the focus, you know, with the Lord is on a different area but uh we'll get into that in a second but sure. the idea of your humanity and what you do for a living um helps connect people too right yes it can make some judgments but so what i, I think people need to know who you are I, what i've seen and read so far I, I this is an honor to meet you well likewise likewise i was looking forward to our conference too so uh you know but i'm glad we're hooking up now so let's make the best of it absolutely so uh, <laughs> apparently you've written a book so tell me about your writing yeah, I've, I've had a few books. They're all self-published at this point. I just, I've never felt led to send them to, to a publisher, but I mean, I've spent some time with them, but the, the latest book and the biggest book by far is, is called God versus evil. Uh, and then the subtitle is sculpting an epic theology of God's heroic goodness, oh, wow. which is, which is really what my heart is, is, um, you know, the area of theology called theodicy, uh, which not, not a lot of people have heard that, but it's, it's the area that talks about uh, justifying and understanding God's goodness in a world where evil seems to exist on a significant level. And well, isn't, that God, where, isn't that where most people have their hangups? They say, well, if God is good, how can you let this happen? Or, you know, what about that mad God in the, in the, in the Bible? How does that compare with this Jesus you're trying to tell us about? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you could say, you know, when our kids come to us, and believe me, with seven, I've had every question asked to me at one level or the other, starting, starting. Did you, the, did you just say seven kids? Yeah, yeah, we've got seven. Wow. But, uh, we used to have these Bible books, and you'd read about Noah and the Flood, and all these other Sodom and Gomorrah, and, you know, the nice little cartoon characters that make God sound like a monster. So I got to the point, I got to the point where I just edited them edited them as I read them. Wow. <laughs> so, um, and uh, the kids, you know, make fun of me now about it. They're all grown. Uh, but they just said, you would just change, you know, just to, just to insert Satan back into it because <laughs> the New Testament attributes things that, to Satan that the Old Testament attributed to God. So interesting. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, if, if you follow if you follow that track of thought, you go back and you see even Jewish Jewish theology to this day believes Satan to be uh, an obedient angel. They don't see Satan as an enemy angel, whereas Christianity does. And that's where really the split came. Wow. So so that in the Old Testament for them to say uh, God creates good and God creates evil, that's based on the premise that they see Satan as God's left hand of wrath. And maybe the, you know, the angel of the Lord is God's right hand of mercy, but they see both joined at the hip. Whereas in the New Testament, Jesus comes and he differentiates those two. He pulls the, you know, the divine attributes away from Satan and paints Satan as a, as a cause, whatever, however you want to define him. And that's not vital that we do that. But I mean, it, it shows that Satan is the, uh, uh, when Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven, one aspect of that is, that he came to pull the attributes that we've been projecting onto the Father that are in heaven. He, he came to bring those down, uh, you know, to reveal that Satan has fallen, that those attributes are not in the divine Abba. They're not in the divine nature. And that God is only good, and that's the good news, that God is only good, he's only love, he's only light, and he's only lightness, you know, the, the, those qualities. So that, some, that, some religious circles will disagree or tack on, yes, but he's also wrath, anger, justice, and all those terms which muddy the water. Sure, and um, I think, you know, this is kind of a, you know, it's, it's a nuanced point, but uh, the whole thing with duality is, see, mm. Judaism would say that Christianity is dualistic because we, have, we believe in a Satan and a God in opposition to each other. But if you look up the definition of duality, it, it's only duality if, in the purest sense, if it says that there'll never be a winner. So that Satan and God will forever fight. Well, Christianity doesn't teach that. Satan is a defeated foe now. Well, wait a minute. Uh, I saw a picture of Jesus and Satan doing arm wrestling. Okay. And it, looked <laughs> like a, it looked like a pretty even battle to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder who, I wonder, you know, what was going on when that went on. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that Satan's hand has already been put down and, you know, it's been called and it's, you know, it's up to us to enforce that. But, but to finish the point is, is that, so Judaism would say that Christianity is dualistic, but in reality, and, and listen, I've studied Judaism. I love Judaism. I have many, many, my best friends growing up were, were Jewish. I studied Messianic uh, Christianity for quite a while. I practiced it for quite a while. Wow. You know, Martin Buber and what he wrote about I and thou, the, and he was, you know, Hasidic Jew. I mean, they've, they've totally blessed me. But one area, the one area that I disagree them, with them is, is that this area of duality, because what they've done is they've, they've moved the duality from the outside to the inside so that they see God as eternally dualistic, that he, wow. is, he is the creator of God and evil, I mean, of good and evil, and he will always be that, and he <laughs> changes not. So they've moved the duality, and, and so I, I just think it's a blind spot that they don't see that, that really they're the ones being eternally dualistic because they find both of those things to be in the divine nature. Whereas if we look at the New Testament, time and time again, there's no duality God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. <laughs> what? None? I remember, I remember uh, listening to a guy named Bruce Walkup. I've mentioned him before. Uh, Bruce is Baxter Kruger's Australian, uh, one of his teachers. Okay. And uh, he was teaching a series called What is, what is the Gospel? I have it on my YouTube channel. Um, I acquired it and uh, put it up. But uh, what he was teaching was so powerful that, to me, I felt like there was this wall in front of me. Like, why am I not getting this? And then as he was teaching about the idea of duality and where it came in, um, I realized uh, there was no wall in front of me. I was in the wall. I was in the Western wall wow. thinking of cubby wow. holes, and I had no perception that there was something in front of me. I, I was, it was just my world that I didn't know I was immersed into. So that was my culture. This is my upbringing. I just didn't know any better. Yeah, and people that and when we're indoctrinated that way, it, it, it causes us to read a certain way, causes us to presume a certain way. And we don't we don't even understand that that we're not we, we think we're, we're reading openly, but we're really not. We're reading according to the presumptions we've been taught. And um, it's, um, you know, so so to tear away from that, to deconstruct and and to def, and, and to deny that God has duality within him. I think that's the key to the whole thing. So he's not joined with Satan at the hip. He, he is opposed. He came to destroy the works of Satan, not to u utilize them. Okay. He came to destroy them. And, you know, and, and I'm not, I know a lot of people may not think Satan is an angel and that's not really important for this concept because Satan does represent evil in the Bible. However, we might define that. And that, you know, I want to, I have a question for you on that after you're done. Sure. 
Sure. No, no, but, but, but just the idea that, uh, um, that the new Testament is so clear that God is, has no connection in James one, you know, he, uh, he says, God has no connection to evil. I let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God because God doesn't tempt anyone with evil, nor can he be tempted with evil. Hmm. So time and time again, there's these non-dualistic statements. And uh, whereas the old Testament says, uh, I, the Lord form, you know, I, evil and good create light and darkness. I show there be evil in this city and the Lord has not done it. Yes, there's evil. <laughs> That's what the new Testament says. So it, it bends over backward to correct it's an upgrade. I always like to use the term, the New Testament upgrades our understanding of, of Old Testament. And, and I, I, would, I did a teaching the other night on Zoom, but th this whole idea is that there's something called the glop. And the glop is the image of God where we have Satan and God commingled with each other, joined at the hip. And but when, when we come to, uh, under New Testament upgrade, we pull the glop apart. We set, we differentiate. That's a great word. We differentiate the natures of God from the nature of Satan so that we no longer attribute what the Old Testament attributed to God. We attribute it to Satan. And there's even a, a place in the Bible in, in Chronicles, um, in, in the two uh, passages in Kings and in Chronicles where David numbers Israel. And in one place it says, uh, in one place it says it was the provocation of Satan that did it. In another place it says it was the anger of God that did it. So it's it, confusing. Uh, it is confusing, but if that means the wrath of God, what we have perceived as the wrath of God are the provocations of Satan, and we have we have some restructuring in our thought. Life. <laughs> well, I've I've uh, I've almost found the religious world I grew up in. I grew up German Baptist, and then I went you know Pentecostal oh. church, um, then I went to you know Brethren in Christ, and then. Christian Missionary Alliance United, all, all over the place. I got a huge, I call myself multi-tribal. I've been a part of so many groups. There you but, go. but if I look back and I see this discussion of Satan and God, it's almost like the church worships Satan more than Jesus for the power that they can have. So, and what I mean by that, I don't mean they literally worship Satan. That's not what I mean. But they attribute so much power to, oh, Satan is so strong to blind us. Oh, we got to be wary and careful. And all this over-focus on this thing called Satan. And I didn't know any different for many, many years, which I want to get to a question with you shortly. But I always thought there was such a great emphasis on that, that they almost kept them as equals. Yeah. And I think that, uh, um, yeah, that's a real challenging point because every, every time I get asked to speak on something, I always, you know, I talk about Satan maybe the 3% of the time of everything. Well, he ain't the right. topic. Come on. But, it, but it's the thing I'm always asked about because, <laughs> because I hold out for an ontological Satan. Because from an angle, uh, and when I say ontological, I mean a Satan that does exist. Okay. When I hold out for that, without a Satan in the equation, and anyone that studies theodicy will tell you that you, it dumps evil back in God's lap. Mm. Uh, that basically, if there's not, you know, Jesus said a, a, an enemy has done this. When, when, you know, when destructive, when destruction happens and, and uh, evil things are sown among the harvest that God planted, that a, an enemy has done this. So, but at the same time, I don't sit here in my post and talk a whole lot about Satan. I just, it's important to recognize that he's there and that certain things, uh, that certain things are not productive, certain things are toxic, and, and, and that's it. Uh, but Jesus has defeated him. He's all, you know, Colossians says he stripped the principalities and the powers, the fallen powers. Um, so it's just us enforcing that victory. It's mm. us enforcing that victory, walking in that victory. Uh, we're in a mop up, you know, like the, the, when they, when we uh, were at war, you know, there were mop up operations. When I think Japan surrendered, we still had to go through these islands and clean out the islands, you know, from hostile forces, but it was just mop up. And I think, um, I've heard somebody say Satan's tail is just thrashing. He's dead. He, you know, he's, he's, he's been immobilized except for the tail that thrashes. And uh, of course, Bunyan had that famous metaphor that, uh, you know, if we stay on the Lord's highway, Satan is like uh, two lions on both sides of the road chained. Uh, as long as we stay on the Lord's highway, he can't touch us. Um, you know, and I think that's a good, healthy way to do it. So the, the key, as with most things, I suppose, is, is that we have a balance to where we don't obsessed because you're you're exactly right to to obsess about satan to obsess on his plans to obsess on his schemes is it ends up being another scheme itself you know that causes us to divert from being led by the spirit and, and and walking in the spirit but on the other hand 
you know, Paul warns us, he says, we're not ignorant of his schemes. And that includes that scheme. <laughs> you know, True. Not, yep, yep. Yeah. So, uh, but anyhow, that, that's, uh, uh, it, it's a fine walk, but um, I think that, um, and coming from the charismatic movement, I think you said you said you were, uh, came to the Pentecostal, or did you yeah. think it was a Pentecostal okay. church? Yeah, yeah. Well, but I mean, that's just a tribe name. It's a T-shirt. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got Jesus yeah. tattooed on the bottom. So. <laughs> well, you know, I come from the Word of Faith. I, I went through the Valley of the Word of Faith for a while, and I wouldn't trade any. I, I learned a lot of good things there. But now, with my, you know, with wisdom and age, and and a little more patience with things, you know, you take the the caricature okay. Okay. elements out of it. And uh, you just co create a rabbit trail. I've got this thing called ADHD. Hey, look, a squirrel. Um, <laughs> so this idea of uh, you, you grew and had value in the word of faith movement. I, I value my background now, um, but there was a time and I'm assuming you have too, but how would you address not knocking all of that so quickly because i know when we begin the journey of rediscovering a better faith or a, a deeper faith or deconstructions another word um we tend to spit at those that uh, that say the things we don't believe anymore and it's almost venomous and it's become really unhealthy in deconstructionist circles have have you dealt with that at all or addressed oh, that I absolutely absolutely you know there's a there's a passage in ecclesiastes i haven't quoted it in quite a while but it says it says basically uh make sure with your left hand you hold on to what you grabbed before and reach forward to the new thing with your right hand hmm. and you bring both of them to god and i think that that's the challenge in something like this we have this recency bias as what i've heard it called which is where what's the new toy what's the new revelation Ooh. what's the new the new uh, image here and i let go of everything else and I think that's not, you know, I, I, that's not what works for me. And I don't think it's what the Lord, he's blessed us at every level, according to our ability to hear him at that level. I mean, he even, he blessed the people in the Old Testament at the level that they were able to hear him, even yeah. though they misrepresented his character to various degrees. Yep. Moses, that's the sin that kept Moses out of the promised land. He, God told him to, to speak to the rock and call forth water for the people so that the people would know God loved them. But Moses struck the rock in anger. And said, we're disgusted with you. How long must God and I continue to put up with you people? So he misrepresented it. And, and then that, he sent the message forward. That's what God's like. Yes, yes. And, 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 and God says, that's what, you know, when he said you couldn't go into the promised land. I think that that's an allegory. Yeah. But, you know, you couldn't go into the promised land because you, did, you failed to sanctify my name. Mm -hmm. All right. And so that tells me that if we want to enter the promised land, we need to, we need to do our, I was going to say dead level, but I hate the word dead. We need to do our live level best. To, to, to sanctify his name mm -hmm. as a God of light, a God of love, and a God of lightness. Those are the three L's I always like to share. Love, light, but lightness. Because Jesus said my, you know, in the weight sense, Jesus said my yoke is light. Mm -hmm. And people are so bur burdened down and heavy. Heaviness is such an enemy. And that's, you know, in these days, you and I were talking earlier, but in these days, heaviness is a real enemy right now. And, it is. Uh, it's and, confusing. Yeah. Yes. Like, like I've got friends who are on the journey of deconstruction, rediscovering, like for, for me, my deconstruction began with identity in Christ. And with the, the starting point of identity for me began with a book uh, by Bob George, Classic Christianity. And it, it began to talk about my absolute forgiveness. Then I read Grace Walk and then I read You Name. I went on and on and on, Bill Gillum's books. And I just went crazy on, on discovering things. But in that journey, uh, I did not know I was forgiven. And then I was led to other things and I just kept growing and growing and growing. Um, but that didn't stop. It, it, it kept going. And even today uh, I'm growing and growing, but now we have this uh, people on the journey of deconstruction and COVID has hit. So there's a whole flood of people in the last year or two that have been unlearning. Now we're getting the toxic politics and the toxic information of uh, COVID. Um, you know, the, uh, what do you call that? The uh, antidote or whatever they call that thing. Um, but all these medical, this medical advice all coming at us. And so if you're already tired from thinking through your faith, now you must be exhausted. So how do we approach all this? What would you say to someone that's just tired and exhausted from all this? Yeah, I would just say that in every, in every storm, there's an opportunity to focus, an opportunity to hunker down, an opportunity to stop. And um, I was telling you earlier that one thing in, uh, when we were homebound here is that I ended up really getting to have just uh, unbelievably good 
moments with my children uh, who are adults now, uh, but we have several of them still living here. <laughs> and uh, but uh, just to be able to connect with them on an adult level uh, has been valuable, you know, so uh, it has been one of the best things that have ever happened. I'm a better father for being homebound for that reason. And, um, you know, and then I know you and I were talking about, uh, you know, um, in the middle of this thing, I, I just got an unction from the Lord and I just kind of protected it. Cause you know, those things will get blown out. If you're not, if you, if you, if you don't keep it protected was, was to lose some weight and get back in shape. And, and I, and, and I was able to do that. Um, so those are positive things. Yeah, we all noticed. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, there's not, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to reconnect with your spouse, opportunity to reconnect with your family, opportunity to reconnect with your health. You know, these, 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 uh, if, if, if we're being handcuffed in a sense, uh, circumstantially, then we're more free. That's a Paul. I mean, they're in there in the jail singing, you know, praises to God, and then the jail opens up, and then they don't even go. <laughs> you know, just and he didn't even fight for his rights and freedom, did he? Oh, I know. He, he, it's like the more you try to chain me, the more free I become. And listen, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big biscuit to swallow, but I know it's true, especially the more that we're uh, devotionally focused on the Spirit. That that's certainly been the Lord. Is, but when I, perceive I'm, when I perceive I'm handcuffed, I am handcuffed. You know, and uh, but if you look for the opportunities and look and and look for the lightness, and I always remember one of my best friends told me it was his mantra basically. But he always said, you know, God's a God of encouragement, not discouragement. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, you know that's really always stuck with me. And he well, you know, you got to filter the comments and the filter the messages coming your way. You got to stop it at the door and ask, what is this? Is this discouraging? That cannot be the fruit of God. Yes, yes, and it works fear and angst and just insecurity and, and uh, in you. And, and um, it's, uh, I was thinking earlier today, you know, what I know about politics could fill a thimble. And then I had a second thought, no, it really couldn't even fill a thimble. <laughs> what I know, it couldn't fill a thimble. So um, I, I don't, I, I, so I stay away from politics. I'm, I'm, I don't begrudge anyone wherever they're led to stand mm -hmm. and contend for the faith. I just know I'm not called there. Yeah. And uh, being a lawyer, I, I've got to deal with enough crisis situations oh, yeah. that, that I, I can't really even process any others. Uh, yep. So um, I kind of uh, leave that topic alone because in my, what I have learned over the last 20, 30 years, I've been a, I've been a pastor for 30 years and this October I'll be married 30 years. And the right constant right? advice of, of, of mentors has been, don't bring in politics because the moment you do, you suddenly divide yourself. So if you have three or four main political parties, you just lost a few of the others. If it's two, then you lost 50%. It's, it's just not worth it. So I've well, I, actually, I actually posted, you know, I, I love uh, David Hart, David Bentley Hart. And oh yeah, I, he's good. I posted something that was, uh, <laughs> well, I posted something where he said something negative about Trump. And I, I wasn't posting it for that reason. I was posting because he said some things about Satan. He had some great quotes in there. But when it was over with, I, I had to repent. I apologized to everybody on Facebook because there was no need to get into it. I could have quoted the good part without quoting that part. Didn't David also apologize for that? Well, or I don't was, know. Or was that you? Who, that was your, oh, I saw yeah. that. And I saw yeah. your apology. I thought, wow, that, that's integrity. Okay, yeah. it was you. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am that guy. That's uh, cool. But it, it, it's just not what I want. To, it's not how I, what I want to be known for. What it's I not wanted. what you're about. Um, and it was, uh, and I know he's rhetoric, you know, he's strong with the rhetoric and, and, uh, and I love him. And, and, um, but, uh, you know, I just, that's that I, I can't buy, I don't have to automatically share everything that he says. I need to be more discriminating. You know, if I'm going to share it with other people, then we're, we're under a duty to filter it out and, yep. you know, spit out the same. What was that and, word? Filter? Yeah. <laughs> filter yeah that that would what a better world it would be if we all filtered uh i know and, and um and because and even getting back to the old testament a lot of it was unfiltered you know I, it was all inspired and it all speaks of christ in some mystical way because he said that on the road to emmaus it all speaks of me but it doesn't speak of him in an apparent sense you you, you got to have the holy spirit and go in there and and see the way paul reinterpreted old testament yeah, you don't, you don't read the Old Testament to understand the new. You go, it's the other way around. Yes, yes, yes. What, what yes. I've come to see, I, I don't know what you think of this, but 
my, the biggest revelation I've had in the last couple of years is Jesus speaking to, to Philip say, Hey, what do you mean you want to see God, the father? If you've seen me, you've seen the father. We're the same. We're one. And so, and he also said elsewhere, no one's seen the father. So every single writer in the old Testament has been incomplete. Not yes. a single writing of the Old Testament is, is complete picture of who God is. Therefore, it's incomplete. You can't draw a full conclusion of whatever you read there. Amen. Which is why Paul said that they were children in need of a tutor. Yeah. You know, because they only had a partial uh, recognition of God. And I, I shared this the other night, but I, I had a dream one time that ended up being pretty prophetic, as it turned out. But it was just the idea that I saw God and he was dressed in samurai armor. <laughs> and um um and i knew it wasn't that wasn't his true shape but i went up and i tore the armor off and then underneath there was like knight english armor you know like a knight from the uh, middle ages and i knew that wasn't right either and i keep turning off all the wow. all the uh, levels and then underneath he was just a muscular shepherd and even that was a form of armor you know on one level but anyway the, the in the wake of that i saw that those are the things we project onto god's image but here's the thing and um, I, I'll share something re- with you real quick that, my, that really blessed my son, and he's been applying it. I love it when you share something with your kids, and then you see them apply it to situations, you know, a particular scripture, a particular. Yeah, the instance. fact they listen to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, it's, uh, and that came out of the COVID thing. That, that was when I shared this particular thing, but it was, it was about when uh, uh, Jesus said to, you, to Peter, do you love me? And, you know, the Greek, you probably heard this before, but the Greek of what was going on there was he said, Peter, do you agape me? Mm-hmm. And then Peter said, Lord, you know, I phileo you, which is the, 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 the brotherly one. form of love and the friendship form of love. And Jesus said a second time, Peter, do you agape me? And he said, Lord, you, you know I phileo you. And then, and then the third time he says, well, do you phileo me? And then he says, Lord, I phileo you. Wow. And that's a beautiful scene of how God meets us. But, but you do at. know that's the answer a fisherman has to give. Flail fish, right? <laughs> no, touche. That's good. You are quick. <laughs> uh, but but just the, the idea there that God meets us where we're at on the level that we're able to receive him. And if, if you receive him as a samurai warrior, he's not going to just say, okay, I'm going to walk. I'm out of here. Forget it. You know, he's going to stay behind that samurai armor and try to get to you on the level where you can hear him. Yeah. And hopefully he'll lead you to a place where you can tear that armor off of him and get to the next level and, uh, and keep, and our life is just sanctifying his name, taking the next level off the, of wrong things we projected mm. on and then getting down to the, the meat of the matter, which is just the pure love light, the non-dualistic nature of God is light, love and lightness. You yeah. know? So. Well, you, you had a, you had a CS Lewis dream. You know that that's, that's from the um, voyage of the dawn treader where the dragon, um, wants to jump in the water, but the lion says, uh, no, 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 I gotta, I gotta undress you first. And so first the dragon tries to r- scratch off the scales and there's one layer of scales. And now he wants to jump in the water, but he looks at his skin. Oh, it's back. It's another layer. Keeps doing it. And then finally the lion says, I gotta take it off of you. And the, the nails or the claws go in and rip that, that skin, that gross, disgusting exterior off of this dragon. And suddenly there's a boy. And he's red from all the raw hurt. And the lion grabs him and throws him in the water. And it stings for a minute. But, oh, the coolness of it. Oh, I love that. that, That's an image of the journey of counseling for me. That's my story of how I've come through my journey of sexual abuse counseling. And it took a long time, many layers. Just when I thought I was healed, there's another layer. What the heck? So, there's more. And for each one of us too, like you've had your journey of, of discovering a better, deeper picture of God that is pales to what you, what you used to believe in. It's like more and better. Right. So people need to realize there, there's hope and that you shouldn't hurry up your journey. You know, yeah. if this COVID time gives you time to pause, work out, lose some weight, <laughs> you know, or, or just be still and change a habit or two slowly so that you can actually experience the divinity within maybe maybe that's all maybe it's not yeah. some big list yeah I, I i couldn't agree more i think we we uh, good habits you, you know you, you you don't hear the lord because you have good habits you but you can hear the lord in good habits and yeah. th- those are good meeting places you know good habits uh, i i've seen all sorts of things where the lord's let me find my hunger again obviously if you, if you lose 40 pounds you're going to find your hunger <laughs> But, but hunger is a good thing, you know, and spiritual hunger is a good thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, you know, to stoke our hunger and, and, and to appreciate it, to, to feel it at the core of your belly. And, you know, Jesus said, out of your belly flows, flows the, 
living water and um yeah my was, my water's building up <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> but it's living water <laughs> <laughs> hey uh let, let me yeah. throw a question your way um sure. i still didn't get to the the satan question because i want i want to get you to address the okay i'll ask you the Satan question then we'll get to the um uh what you've been excited uh, uh about and what you're learning recently what has been the most exciting fun revelation that's got you so fired up but before that okay there are people that are hearing about Satan not being real. It's just a figment of our imagination. Then others are saying, well, it's a little different where we're seeing the scriptures a little different, all these different views and perspectives from zero Satan to he's full on, you know, he's got swords and he's going. Um, how would you encourage those who are hearing too many voices and frustrated by this? Um, because, I, I don't address the topic much because I still have too much learning to do. I'm, I'm reading the scriptures and this is what I'm seeing. It may not be exactly what I'm seeing. I'm open to learning more, but how would you address somebody that's really having a hard time with multiple voices? Well, um, I think, you know, Brad, Brad Jerzak and I've had some good talks, uh, correspondences about, about Satan. He, you know, he doesn't believe um, that Satan has ontology in the sense of being a particularized being, an actual being. However, he believes that there is, uh, as I, and, yeah, I don't want to speak to him, I'm just giving you my understanding mm -hmm. of what he believes, because we've had some great talks about it. But he does believe there's a force out there, that Satan is a force out there that's become uncoupled from the divine will, and that uh, it's something that is empowered, something in us corporately that has become uncoupled mm -hmm. and is, and is, uh, producing circumstantial evil, producing these things that we would have attributed to a dark angel. So I think that to bring comfort, you know, I happen to believe it's, there's angelic, you know, it's an angelic personality because that seems to be what the scriptures say. But at the same time, I don't think that you have to believe that to have a healthy view of it. Yeah. You can believe um, that, you know, it can be a dark angel. I've, I use this, this thing. It can be a dark, um, angel or a dark angle of, of human existence or dark angle of, of, of hum, the human psyche individually and corporately. And uh, that this thing, whatever it is, and even Walter Wink, you know, who, who did not, he, he was, you know, believed the same thing, you, that there wasn't an uh, ontological Satan, but even he said, there does seem to be something out there that's more virulent, that's more evil than just the, the shadow, the human shadow. So, you know, there's some things in the metaphysical realm, Mike, that I think we or need mystical? to get to the uh, yes, yes, that, that we have to be satisfied with rough answers. Mm. I, I, what turns me off is when I hear someone tell me about all the courts of heaven and all the particular types of yeah. angels and all this. And they have diagrams for them. <laughs> no, I know. I have to say, you know, that's going too far out on a branch and you can just see you go farther out in a branch and then the thing breaks. But, you know, it's okay to have rough answers. The very nature of metaphysics means we aren't going to have that precise knowledge, mm. all right? And, and that's the realm where metaphors, allegories, we can only come in Jesus, the kingdom of God. It was, it's like this. We can only, so when, when, when we have to use imagery like that, we have to satisfy ourselves. You know, sometimes a rough answer is a good answer. Mm -hmm. and, and the wisdom comes from not trying to make a rough answer smooth when, it, when we're incapable of smoothing it out. I had a, a previous mentor tell me that uh, you might've heard this quote that um, God told him in a dream that I am not a mystery to be solved, uh, but a, sorry, I'm not a, I'm not a puzzle to be solved, but a mystery to be explored. Yes. And that, yes. that's kind of what I've, what I've taken on for my pursuit of these categories of theology that I'm okay with some mystery. I'm okay with being teachable and I'm okay with being wrong for now. Like, cause I've, I've changed, I've grown. And if I've changed this much, here's an example and times, Holy smokes. If I've had to change that much in that concept, let alone identity, how much more good news is coming. So to teach and, and have an open hand of God put in, take out whatever you gotta is a good, good place to be in my mind. Well, yeah, and, and, and I'll tell you one other thing about the Satan thing. As I've, stud as I've studied the church fathers, um, uh, Isaac and some of the other church fathers had a view of Satan that uh, it was all about false identity. In other words, they would say that uh, if Lucifer, let's accept for a moment that Lucifer, which would be a nickname, uh, an appellation, it wouldn't be the, the formal name, but uh, of, of, of Satan, uh, what he was before, that he was created good, 
uh, but that Satan comes and there is a mask, a false identity, which then, and uh, uh, th this dark, an you know, he's turned into the dark angel. And, but see, the, the, the false identity is he loses being. He becomes, he becomes privation of being. Hmm. which is what evil some people believe that evil is it's just a pri you're not you're not ontological at all because you become a plasticized uh thing that's not real that's hmm. not alive that's not, you're you're like your husk i don't know if you saw the matrix but the, i the love the that oh my goodness the matrix movie everyone has been homogenized into agent smith everyone on the world but at the end when neo when instead of fighting him when neo lets him absorb him the light goes into Agent Smith, and he no longer can contain the light. And you see everyone, all the all the Smith masks blow apart. And that's the first. Meet. That's the first image in movie form I've ever seen of Jesus becoming sin. Yes, 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 yes. It is perfect. It, I know people bash the third movie, but really, it's brilliant. It's, it's Christ, brilliant. It's a Christ is Victor, yep. you know, uh, type of thing where Jesus yep. goes down and lets Satan thinks he's won. You know, whatever this thing is, um, and, 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 and just to bring it home, I mean, to people, we, we can see it work in our own lives that, you know, there are certain me's when I'm operating with a mask on. I know this thing that I'm acting out of now isn't alive. I'm, this, isn't, this isn't Richard. This isn't the real me, you know, and it's, it's some plasticized uh, mockery. You know, it's not the real me. And then when the Lord comes and softens it, then that, that husk just kind of cracks off. And then you're able to repent, renew your mind and get through the thing. Uh, so I, all that by way of saying that I think there are healthy ways to view this um, that, um, you know, that makes it still relevant. But, you know, our focus is never, uh, you know, our focus is never on, should be never on proving the ontology of Satan. It's, it's on sticking on the ontology of Jesus. Yeah, there's more, and, there's more good news the other way. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and as we deal with it, and, yeah. and, and I believe the Lord wants us to deal with these masks, whether we want to call them angelic masks or or. Dar uh, or, uh, you, you know, just human mass that have become uncoupled from the divine will. I mean, when I look at what Brad and I say, we're basically saying the same thing. It's just, he says it's not ontological. I say, I believe it's an, an angel doing it, but it's, we believe whatever the Satan is, it has power. It operates to the, where our neglect mm -hmm. operates, where we neglect our so great a salvation that gives access. You know, Paul said, don't give access to the devil. Mm -hmm. There are things that we do corporately that allow evil to flourish. Yeah. Uh, but but at the same time, we can go in there and we can drive the evil out with the light of God. But that comes from devotional light. You know, that mm -hmm. comes from being devotional with the Lord. That doesn't come from addressing, you know, of just being Satan focused. So, I mean, it is it is a, it's a sensitive thing. I think every human, every part of creation, every molecule has the light of Christ shining through everything. Um, I did a, a number of messages on the idea of light and even Jesus said, Hey, if the light that is in you, if that light that is in you, if that light is darkness to you, Oh my goodness, how great is that darkness? Yes. And so to see and look at others, especially in this COVID time where we see a lot of fighting going on, if we see each other, that there's a light of Christ in that person, they are one with Christ and that makes you one with them. Be careful how you treat your own body. And yes. oh my goodness, that, that just messes you up really fast and can humble you really fast. And, 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 and to look at them and say, this person is made in the image of God. Yeah. And yet all this toxic stuff that we're talking about, this plasticized masks that they put on, you know, Jim Carrey, there's a great scene in the mask movie. <laughs> I love that. Where that masks, it, it looks like Jim Carrey, but it's grafted itself onto his face and he can't pull the thing off. Yeah. And then at the end of it, you know, at the end of it, he, he, he finally manages it to, because he's in love, he finally manages to wrench it off and he throws it in the lake. And I feel that that's a, that's a metaphor for the lake of fire. Mm. You know, that what goes in the lake of fire are our masks, are these masks that we built up over a lifetime. And, you know, through repentance and renewal of the mind, we cast, and that's what burns in the lake of fire. These, yeah, the these stuff masks. that isn't the real us anyway. Exactly, exactly. And that's the way, that's the way an all powerful father would do it. He wouldn't sit through, he would throw us in the fire. He would throw what, he would throw what impoverishes us into the fire. Yeah, you know? Brad wrote a good book on hell. I think uh, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut. One of the best books I've yeah. read on the topic. Yeah, totally it's agree. Crazy. Totally all agree. right, let, let me throw another thing your way. Um, what has been the most recent and exciting good news things you've been discovering or exploring that you'd like to share or can share or what, even if you haven't arrived at it yet, but inspire us with, uh, with your journey. I'd be interested in hearing. I don't know you very well. So this is, yeah. to me, this is exciting. 
I think that, that for me, in my, in, in my own walk, it, it would be that uh, God has brought me peace about what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've struggled, you know, over the years with, because I don't send my books out, you know, to publishers. I don't really promote stuff. I really don't join with stuff that promotes it. And I've never felt good doing it. I've never felt good not doing it. But I would say over the last six months, the Lord's given me peace, just that he's got me right where he wants me. And if it's, if it's me just doing essays, putting them on Facebook, blessing a few people, then I shouldn't even think about that. I, I, I'm just to keep creating what the Lord's put in me to express and to try to hone it and perfect it. And I don't know what's going to happen with it. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, um, I think I, I've, I've just had some anxiousness that has gone for me in that. And I'm, I'm content. I'm perfectly content with what's going on and, and with what's going. And it's almost to the day where that contentment gain, uh, came is, is like when I was able to lose the weight and able to do other things. Yeah, I just feel some alignment. That would be. Okay. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, there's such a flurry of activity and ideas of good things to think about the Lord and good things to receive from the Lord that uh, the minute you start trying to micromanage it and plan it, it'll wear you out <laughs> and you'll be worrying about what I don't have instead of what you do have. And, um, and then that's just a, a cul-de-sac, you know, and it just, uh, it's a form of neglect. And, you know, the Hebrews always, uh, Hebrews says, how shall we escape the evils of this world if we neglect our so great a salvation, mm -hmm. which tells me that our really, our only responsibility is just to pay attention to our salvation you know, to pay attention to its implications, to pay attention to its quality work that it wants us to walk in and be a part of, to its, uh, you know, to the intimacies, you know, to the glowings of the Lord, to the showings of the Lord, to all those things um, that, uh, you know, th that's our only responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if, if something happens and an opportunity comes, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not looking for opportunities anymore. I'm just seeking to hear the Lord and writing what's in me to write. And Facebook for me, Facebook for me is a great avenue to do that. And uh, I've, I've been doing it for years and years and uh, you know, freely you receive and freely you give and uh, you know, and the Lord has protected my Facebook page, you know, because <laughs> I, I got attacked by Calvinists for years and years about this, that, and the other, but I, I, I don't generally get attacked on my own page anymore because they've all been driven away by whatever I share. <laughs> but when I have a buddy, what really hurts is when I have a buddy who shares it and then he gets attacked by a whole bunch of, of, uh, Calvinist, which happened a couple of weeks ago, then I feel like I'm supposed to go, you know, help on a thing. And that's really the only trouble. But I'm, I'm, I'm really, my Facebook page is a place of peace for the most part, except when I make mistakes and share something I shouldn't share. Uh, uh, but but I'm that's part that, of the journey too, though. It is. It is. It so is. you said, you said a word responsibility. Um, I don't know if you've talked through that word before, but I, I have a hunch you're experiencing the better intent of it. Instead of responsibility being a duty um, and scripture does not use the word of responsibility anywhere. Instead, a Paul Anderson Walsh, a buddy of mine in, in uh, England, he calls it, we're now response able. We're able yes. to respond. And so we live in response. So I'm hearing you, learning to live and listen and then respond instead of trying to figure it all out and trying to worry and think through everything, but learning to just focus of the, of who is in front of you right now, where God is right now in front of you or in you. Yes. And, and to have in particularly in the area of where, where the Lord's called me to think and to meditate and to explore it, it's in the area where if somebody has a problem with God's goodness and doesn't understand and it becomes an impediment to them, mm -hmm. an obstruction, then I, I believe God's given me enough of a foundation to give a rough answer that they can hang a hat on. It may not be, a, 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 it doesn't explain everything because we'd have to be omniscient to explain everything. Yeah. All right. But it, there's enough of an answer there to bring comfort and to allow someone to still believe in a good, a flawlessly good God yeah. and, um, and, and to camp out on that and to not budge from it. We, he does want us to have enough answers to be confident of that one thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and well, if, so, you're, if, if you're able to offer a spoke in a wheel, because that's really what it is. It's a spoke of uh, a truth or revelation. Some wear out, some spokes are made out of bamboo or brittle birch, you know, yeah, and they'll, right. they'll break. But the more God puts those spokes in, it's him putting that revelation in. And that leads to more and more. Like I look back at my journey and 
if I if I had to make a marker for each spot of and who influenced my life, I, I often thank a lot of people when I go back and I find somebody I bumped into say, hey, you spoke into my life. Thank you. And that meant a lot at that time, which brought me to this other place, which brought me to this. Like, we're not done growing. Yeah, yeah. I used to do a little play on words with connect the dots of going back in your past and seeing it as connecting the dots. But there's the Hebrew word for experiential knowledge is dot d-a-a-t dot oh so if you connect the dots those are times when we've experienced the lord which mm-hmm. like peter we, if, if we experience in phileo then he'll give us as much phileo as we can handle all right and then if it comes a time when we're able to ascend up into agape and uh, which is holy ground you know we'll take our shoes off and get in there and and um he'll do it but he, the amazing thing about the lord is that no matter where you're at no matter what level of maturity you're at he is just as there it's a, it's a question of what armor we projected on him, but he's there. He's there behind the armor waiting to reveal himself to us. And, and not everything at once. Hey, who could, who could say, look, I've got 25 layers of armor you put on me. Let's get, you know, just, no, let's just start with today. You know, let, let's remove something today. That- he's going to put you in a David position where no armor works. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go, which I think is what the muscular shepherd was, <laughs> you know, uh, and, uh, and, 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 um, you know, I, I, I relish that. I relish the friendship of God and the intimacy of God. And, you know, if you believe God is bipolar, let's be honest. I mean, you can make that sound holy and, yeah, he's a God of justice, you know, and he's a God of this. But, but you know, it doesn't say that God is justice. And, in fact, the word justice is even nowhere in the New Testament. It's not even, it's not even in the New Testament. You know, righteousness is, you mm-hmm. know, and, and to, say, to be just in the New Testament means you're righteous in the sense that you believe. You know, it's, it's not, it's not anything about eye for an eye. I kind of think he diffused that part. Well, I, I'm pretty sure he said it's not eye for an eye. I say it. I agree. Well, didn't, isn't the Roman empire's mindset of justice payback? Yeah. You know, even the Hebrew, the real Hebrew idea is not payback, but put back. So true biblical justice is God restoring Amen. full restoration to who you originally are. Amen. Amen. You know? Amen. Amen. That's Amen. hard. And, 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 you know, really, it's in our, in our penals. I don't know what it is like in Canada, um, but, I, I mean, here, you know, it's a big debate. Is, is, is Do you rehabilitate? Is rehabilitation what prison is about or is it about penal revenge? You know? Well, people come to the court system. They say sorry, and we let them go. It's easy. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I don't do that here. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, but, as uh, they say, the Canadians will take over the U.S., and then you'll all be sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I stay away from that. I'm kidding. <laughs> I know you are. But, you know, I, I did want to share one thing which you were saying about listening a while ago. You know, you told me you were a German Baptist at some point, and I love German theology. And what, one and you know the, what that means. That's strict and strict. Double. Uh, 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 okay. German, well, strict, Baptist, strict. I got so double whammy. Real, but is that a real denomination or was that your term, term? No, that was a German. It was a German Baptist church. as an okay. offshoot. Yep. It's real. But one good thing about the German theology was that um, – it had this word called uh, Galassenheit, and it, for short, it was Lassen. And when you said listen, that's what made me think about it. We listen. That Galassenheit is this idea that uh, we yield to the Lord. It's, hmm. it's, not, uh, it's not that we choose. It's less than a choice. Uh, it's not a choice. Uh, and one of the sayings, that, you know, is, is what, what we have is freedom of choice, but what we want is freedom from choice. Yeah. So, so to be delivered from choice itself, choice, and especially in this COVID thing, that's what wears us out in these things. We have to choose this or this. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's right? Who's wrong? But you know what? You wouldn't have to choose any of that. Lastening is the idea that we, it's consent. It's basically a consent where we consent to the promptings of the spirit. We don't, we don't lay it all out, you know, in terms of some formal thing. We just, we're looking to, to respond to the spirit continually ongoing throughout the day. Mm. Um, and it's a yieldedness, but it's an aggressive yieldedness. It's not one where I choose my path of righteousness because, you know, <laughs> we'll get worn out by midday doing that. But it's one where we just, we, it's like surfing. We're, we're out there in the, like I would know surfing, right? But, but I mean, like we're, out, we're, like we're on our surfboard and we're looking for a wave and we catch a wave of the spirit and then we ride it in. But that's, and I love that. I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous, it's a, and I think Brad has written on this before too, this particular term, but it's a good word. Uh, and it's a good thing for, you know, for this time period, you know, mm-hmm. but when you said, listen, I thought of Lassen, you know, that, that's that cool. Guiltiness, that guiltiness. I don't know. I don't know that word. Uh, and I'm German. So I, I didn't connect at all. Yeah. Well, I'll shoot you a paper. I've got a little link on it where I wrote a paper on it. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd like know. that because I'm, I, 
I had a conversation with Paul Young a couple of weeks back and he was saying that most of us are fantasy thinking, well, however the conversation went, we're thinking ahead into a world or a scenario where God isn't. It hasn't happened and we're already full of anxiety, worrying about all these scenarios and we're making these backup plans just in case, which I'm a pro at. Um, but instead to just stop and learn to listen to what is right. The only thing true is what's right in front of you right now. 10 minutes from now is not true. 10 minutes ago is not true. What's right now is true. And that, that really stuck. That was, that was really cool. You know, when, as a lawyer, I will tell you the hardest thing for me as a lawyer is what you just described, thinking of nightmare scenarios of cases. They taught oh. me. They taught me. <laughs> That's your job. You're wrong. paid to do that. <laughs> I know. But what could go wrong? What's going to happen? What happens if the judge says this or this says this? And it wears me out just thinking about it. And, and, wow. and it brings a blurb and things like that uh, that I don't want to do. But, but just today, I was dealing with a DA uh, on a case that he's been pretty obstinate on in the past with me about. And I dreaded talking to him. I absolutely dreaded. And I had this inkling, well, why don't you pray before you pick up the phone? Why don't you pray for God to help you in this conversation? And I did. And it, the conversation went great. It was nothing that I feared, nothing that I, that I dreaded. He, he, uh, we agreed on something that we've been trying to get done for a while and he finally agreed to it. And it was just like, gosh, if I did this all the time, instead of worrying and letting these scenarios, worst case scenarios, assault me from all things. And I just said, why don't I just pray about this and ask God for you to align my thoughts and give me favor in this hmm. thing. Uh, what, a different, what a different world it would be. How, how much uh, better our thought life might be, my thought life. Uh, so anyway, but what Paul said is absolutely what I've been, you talk about a good, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, that's a good thing that's been happening to me is that these, mm -hmm. this darkness has been this worst case scenario thing uh, with work. That's why I don't really have in other areas of my life, but just didn't work, you know, yeah. so uh, that, but that's, that's getting better. You know, I, I think I'm, I would I'm encourage, blessed. I would encourage anybody listening to this to not so much listen to the words that we've been talking about, but listen to what the Holy Spirit's prompting. Because uh, when I saw one of your posts, I was inspired to something for me personally, right? Now, we talked about this before, before they came on the show, but that was from my lens of where I had been growing in anxiety in, and the Lord spoke to me through your post, just that one post, which caused this conversation, which is great. Um, but there might be other topics that we've talked about today that will trigger things like, and you're not done learning. I'm not done learning, but I would love to have another conversation with you sometime. So, cause we're, we're just about done here. We're, we're out of yeah, time. Anytime, anytime I'm honored. I, I just, uh, you know, I'm honored to be here. And I, and I would just say what, you know, the Lord, the Lord has things for each one of us, just for us, especially for us. And I, I just want to echo what you said that just, uh, you know, the Lord wants to speak to each one of y'all in your own emotional language, in your own thinking. And it doesn't have to align with anything else we said, you know, but just listen, <laughs> listen for yourself. Yep. That's really cool. Well, I'm going to wrap this up because uh, it's, it's uh, almost seven here in Ontario. Well, you're, we're in the same time zone, so I think we're fine. Right. But uh, anyway, thank you for the time. Uh, pleasure meeting you for the first time. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. And hopefully we can pull off that conference in Windsor sometime when COVID's done. So uh, be, let's make it happen. I'm all for it. All right. Well, thank you, Richard. You have a really great day. Thanks for taking time uh, to speak with me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope we do it again. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having right. me. Thank All you right. very much. We'll catch you again. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, my. That was fun. I forgot that uh, how long ago. That was two years ago. Oh, my goodness. Um, what a thrill. And uh, I've really come to love and respect Richard um, a lot. And uh, he he's on our program often. So anyway, I uh, thank you for taking the time to watch today. Uh, some of you, I saw Paula just commented earlier uh, that she usually doesn't watch live. And a lot of you don't. You watch later because so, it's 8 a.m. But I know in the evenings, there are a lot of other teachers doing their programming. It's like, you know, this isn't about competition. This is about uh, finding a slot that works. And this works for me. It's the best time that works for my schedule because my evenings can be busy. And, you know, when you have 20 different teachers in the evenings that uh, are on, how do you pick? You can't, you can't watch them all. It's impossible. So uh, you go with the ones that uh, you're drawn towards at any given time. And it's, it's pretty fun. Marianne, good morning or evening. I don't know what time it is by you in Australia, but uh, uh, hello to you too. Anyway, that's it, folks. I hope you have a great week, and we look forward to next week. We'll see you Wednesday morning on Still Growing in Grace. 
Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.